Hi everyone, thank you guys so much for all being here. So stopping a huge hydroelectric dam project that would have contaminated the drinking water for three Mexican villages might seem like an incredibly overwhelming task, but for Natalie Bridgman Fields, class of 1999 in the College of Arts and Sciences, um, it's all in a day's work. Thanks to Accountability um, Council, the nonprofit Fields founded to defend the environmental and human rights of communities around the world. The fate of the Cerro de Oro hydroelectric project was handed over to the villagers who stopped construction. Before founding the, the Accountability Council in 2009, she served as the, I'm sorry, where she serves currently as the executive director. Fields worked as a lawyer at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodbridge, and Rosalie. While there, she served as part of the team that successfully sued a Pinochet era lieutenant in the first US court case to render a jury verdict on crimes against humanities. Fields has also served as a consultant on accountability to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and litigated a wide range of corporate human rights and environmental cases in her own private practice. Fields is incredibly accomplished, as you guys can realize, and she's received national recognition for her work, including the Michael Schwerner National Activist Award and Elle Magazine's Genius Award. In 2011, she was named by the Daily Journal as one of the top 20 lawyers in California under the age of 40. In 2009, Fields was recognized internationally as one of 14 echoing Green Fellows for her groundbreaking work in social entrepreneurship. During her time at Cornell, she participated in the food distribution program, which took leftover food from the dining halls and um, sent them to different food kitchens across Ithaca. And she also participated in the Cornell and Washington program, where she interned for the Center for International and Environmental Law. She also happened to win the prestigious Utah National Environmental Policy Internship. So without further ado, Natalie Bertrand Fields. relationship to everyone in this room, assuming you pay taxes in a rich country. The uh, World Bank, made up of basically rich member countries as the donors and poor member countries as the borrowers, uh, the World Bank invested directly in this project to increase production of oil after a history of oil spills had already been established in this region. And that's where Accountability Council, the organization I founded, came um, to take part in, in helping address uh, these abuses. So these are my clients. This is why I get out of bed in the morning. This is what I do, is to help people who really have no other option for redress. The people of Peru, especially indigenous people in remote regions, uh, frequently cannot use their local courts to remedy harm. Courts are notoriously corrupt. Uh, using the judicial process is expensive, time-consuming, and there is no history or tradition 
of pro bono practice in Peru. So finding a lawyer to represent you is an almost insurmountable task, particularly if you don't exist in a cash economy, as, as my clients do not. So the barriers to litigation domestically are real, and that's the same among most of my client groups around the world. Those barriers to entry to the judicial system, the formal judicial system, are, are very high. I want to give you one more example of, of one of my cases, and this one in a little more uh, detail, to give you an example of, of what we then do in order to address the issues that we face with our clients. In Oaxaca, Mexico, a group of clients came to me, the, the three uh, communities that were um, mentioned by Jonathan in the introduction in this, uh, this community surrounding the Cerro de Oro project. This is a project that was problematic, not because it was a hydropower project, there's no intrinsic problem with a hydropower project, but because the project was being cited on the only available natural source for clean water in the region, being put right on top of it where concrete was going to be poured over the natural spring, and there was going to be an outflow channel that took dirty water from a reservoir and pumped it through to the, to the river. So the people who rely on this water source were, of course, outraged. They hadn't been consulted about the project. The project was being um, constructed right there in their village without their consent. Land had been acquired illegally. Um, these are Chinan Teco speaking indigenous villagers with, um, with the need for all materials to be translated. There was no translation. A number of problems. So they invited accountability council to, to come do trainings, which is the first way that we work with communities. We look at the accountability options in total. We say, well, well, could you bring a court case? Why, why not? Who would help you? How would that be effective? Is there a media strategy? Is there a governmental advocacy strategy? Is there a lobbying strategy of some sort? Um, and what other complaints could you file? To the extent that there's international financing for a project, and I mentioned the case of the World Bank, here there was also international financing in the form of money from our government, from the US government, through the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, or OPIC. In this case, OPIC financed a New York-based investment firm, and that investment firm operated this hydropower project that was operating illegally and without consent. Because of this international hook, we were able, the, the communities here, and they decided to take this strategy up to file a complaint to OPIC's own accountability office. They have an office, a mechanism, in Washington, D.C. that was established specifically to take complaints from communities harmed by the projects they financed. That's the universe of the work that we do at Accountability Council. Instead of using traditional court systems, which I did for many years, instead of that model, I founded Accountability Council to use an alternate form of redress for communities whose waterways are being destroyed, for communities who are, being, um, who are victims of forced labor, <coughs> for communities being forced from their land without consent, <coughs> communities threatened by paramilitaries for opposing projects on their territory, um, for these communities, there are mechanisms that were specifically established to hear their complaints that are not through courts and that no one knows about, generally speaking, uh, that people don't know how to use effectively, even if they do know about them, the very small number that do, and Accountability Council was born in order to address that problem. This is another picture from bulldozing uh, this spring. This is the, one of the communities in the Cerro de Oro uh, area when we filed the complaint the Accountability Office hired a mediator. You see him there in the white shirt. And the mediator came to the region. And I, I was there for many, many weeks on end um, throughout a, a two-year period um, to work with communities, first on filing the complaint, and then in the follow-up through a dispute resolution process, which brought the company and the communities to a dialogue table to see if they could address their grievance. And in this case, the grievance was, we don't want you disrupt disrupting our waterway. And the company said, well, Let's see if we can design a new way of doing this project, and if not, you decide. And if you want us to leave, we will. And it was a historic agreement that's never been reached, to my knowledge, in Mexico, in any other case, and to my knowledge, um, anywhere in the world, where the company has agreed that the, the consent to continue the project must lie in the hands of the people on whose land they're building the project. And in this case, the communities entered in good faith into this dialogue process, and after many, many months decided there was no possible way to redesign the project, without disrupting their lives and their livelihoods and rejected the project. The company uh, accepted the agreement, lived up to their promise, and pulled out. So this was a real victory in showing these alternative resolution models as a really viable form of regress. I would note that in our Peru case, the dispute resolution <coughs> process failed. The company did not enter into good faith into the dialogue process, and we continued to struggle. 
um, today with how to bring redress for our Peruvian clients, although we did get the Peruvian government to take initiative to do an investigation into the company. Um, but that's an example of uh, the limits and the benefits of this model.